Um, thanks everyone for giving your um, little bios and um, discussions about your, your background and your interests. I, I think it's really informative uh, for me and for the TAs and, and for the rest of the, the crew, including Jeff. Um, it's interesting to see the diversity of, of uh, backgrounds that everyone has. And this is something that's often characteristic of these workshops. So um, hopefully you'll find something for everyone here. Um, obviously there'll be some people who will be learning about some of the techniques who are interested in some of the analytical techniques. Uh, some are interested in uh, doing data analysis and data integration. Uh, some of you are veterans in metabolomics, some of you are relatively new, some of you are veterans in bioinformatics, and some of you are new to it. Um, so we'll try and, and accommodate all of those, uh, I think, different backgrounds as much as we can. Um, so uh, without further delay, I guess we'll dive into this. Um, please feel free to interrupt. Uh, most of you are muted, um, so you can turn or unmute if you need to talk, but you can also use the chat and, and some of the other um, devices that uh, Rashad has shown you. Um, this will be uh, the first course I've given uh, large scale in Zoom. I've done a lot of smaller courses, so there might be a few technical challenges as we go through. Uh, so hopefully everyone will be patient as we adjust. Um, so these are the standard slides Rashad has already shown you about how you can share the slides, uh, working on a Creative Commons license. Um, and what we're going to really do for the first part of this um, course is just uh, a gentle introduction to metabolomics. As I said, some of you are relatively new to metabolomics, and we'll talk about some of the technologies uh, for this first lecture, and then we'll start diving more and more into the data analysis. Um, this is the outline. We're a little behind schedule right now, so I might have to rush a little bit. Um, this is on Eastern time. Um, so it's now a little after 11 for those of you on Eastern time. It's a little after nine o'clock for me. Um, so as I said, there'll be this introduction to metabolomics. Uh, then we'll go into metabolite identification. We've identified half hour breaks throughout the, the course. Um, these breaks can be used for lunch for some of you, depending on your time zone. Others, they might be bathroom breaks, but we're also hoping that you can use the breaks to discuss uh, things with us. Um, we can go into various chat rooms um, and we can talk about uh, whether you'd like something changed or added or if there's some other questions that come up. Uh, the breaks are a good time to do that. So you can see that we've got uh, at least uh, three or four breaks through the day. Uh, around three o'clock, we'll be having a, a short lab. Uh, that lab tends to stretch longer than the hour and a half that we that we budgeted. And so likely you'll see the lab going into the break. Um, and then we'll close off with a short discussion on, on databases. And then we have an optional program um, at the end, seven o'clock your time, if you're still awake or still uh, keen to work on this um, to do uh, spectral process and functional analysis. And that will be led by uh, some of the TAs. Tomorrow, um, the focus is on uh, statistics and metaboanalyst. Uh, it's a very popular part of uh, this course. Um, and Jeff will be mostly presenting uh, tomorrow. Um, and then at the very end, we'll have a, a very brief lecture on the future of metabolomics. Um, so hopefully everyone can stay and uh, stay awake uh, for the, the rest of the lectures and labs. Um, so this particular um, uh, lecture is, is to give you get a background or a feel for metabolomics and the metabolome. Uh, we have some standard learning objectives, so to try and identify some of the applications of metabolomics, including lipidomics. Um, and I think many of you have just in your presentations have highlighted just the variety and, and diversity that metabolomics is being used now. We're going to get into uh, some of the techniques, the platforms that uh, people use, uh, LCMS, GCMS, NMR. Um, and then we'll also, as you guys have heard, talk about the differences uh, between targeted and untargeted metabolomics. Uh, some of this might be new to you, some of it's uh, relatively old. Um, so we're diving into uh, a picture I often use to introduce metabolomics. Um, and uh, to sort of, I guess, emphasize the role that the metabolome has in connecting to the proteome and to the genome. Um, at the base of this pyramid of life, we have genes or DNA. Um, 
codes for everything in a cell or in a body or in an organism. Um, when we study DNA, uh, we call it genomics. Uh, the collection of all genes is called the genome. Genes code for proteins, um, and those are kind of the, the workhorses of the cell, whereas the DNA is sort of the, the memory bank of the cell. Um, proteins are there to facilitate chemical reactions and to essentially create or destroy metabolites, and so metabolites are part of the metabolome. Uh, and studying metabolome is metabolomics. As you go up the, the pyramid, you'll find that there's an increasing influence of the different components from genes to proteins to, to metabolites based on the environment and based on physiology. Um, and, and sort of that interface between um, the environment and the cell um, is where metabolomics is particularly useful. Um, Metabolites um, are, are excellent readouts of the phenotype, or the phenome, as people tend to call it. Um, it's, it, it, it lies between the environment and the genome. Um, and in many respects, metabolites tell you what is going on, whereas the genome tells you what might be going on. And so in that regard, metabolites and metabolomics gives you a, essentially a chemical phenotype readout. Um, what you eat, breathe, or drink affects your metabolome, and that's how the environment affects it. It doesn't hopefully affect your genome, otherwise we'd all be really mutant monsters, I suppose. So the genome is very stable to environmental perturbations, the proteome a little less, uh, but the metabolome is quite sensitive to that. The same with physiology. Uh, many of us are taught biochemistry to think of it in terms of purely cells and only cells. But in fact, the organs in any organism, including our, our own bodies, are essentially metabolic organs. Metabolism in the liver is very different than the metabolism in the brain. The metabolism in the heart is very different than the metabolism in the gut. And so the physiological influence also is amplified as you go up. All cells in your body have the same DNA, but all tissues and organs have very different metabolomes. So physiology and environment play a critical role. Um, and this is why I think metabolomics is becoming more and more popular. The contrast between metabolomics and genomics is sort of here. Obviously in genomics, we study genes, and so it's high throughput characterization with next-gen DNA sequencing or transcript analysis. Uh, we're looking at genes in a given cell, tissue, or organism. In metabolomics, it's the same idea. You want to use the same concept of high throughput analysis using probably not sequencers, but things like mass specs and NMR to characterize uh, all of the small molecules in, a meta in, in an organism. So the, that collection of small molecules is the metabolome. We use a definition uh, in metabolomics to talk about essentially organic and even inorganic molecules uh, detectable within an organism that are less than 1500 Daltons. It's not a hard cutoff, but it's one that's been convenient and it's one that's now standardly used. Um, so that means if you use that cutoff, so it can include things like peptides. So looking at small peptides is considered metabolomics. Looking at short DNA RNA fragments is also considered metabolomics. Looking at uh, contaminant metals and or salts is also um, metabolomics. But more traditionally, it includes analysis of things like sugars and nucleosides, nucleotides, organic acids, amino acids, ketones, aldehydes, steroids. It means looking at foods, it looks in, looking at uh, microbial products, it means looking at toxins, pollutants, drugs, and drug metabolites. So it's just about anything uh, that uh, an organism or a body uh, can be exposed to. Uh, includes endogenous things and exogenous things, which might include, if you want, the microbiome. And it ranges over a, a huge range of concentrations from picomolar, with the most sensitive techniques, to concentrations almost up to one molar. So the metabolites is what we define. The metabolome is the collection of those metabolites. And it can include looking at metabolites in a cell, in an organ, in an organelle, in tissues or an entire organism. Um, what we are also realizing is that um, what we can see um, is in the metabolome is often far less than what we know is there. Um, and that includes things like transient molecules, intermediates that occur. 
It includes um, even theoretical molecules in the case of the lipidome. Uh, we know the structure or can imagine or draw the structure of literally hundreds of thousands of lipids, most of which have never been officially seen. What we detect is really defined by the detection technology. So unlike genomics, which has sort of one kind of technology for sequencing, um, in metabolomics, you have to use a lot of different technologies. And because of the issue of the techniques, um, the issue of transient molecules, of um, the technology we have even now, the metabolome, the number of molecules in a given organism is always ill-defined. So we know pretty much the exact number of genes in E. coli, the exact number of genes in Arabidopsis and Drosophila, and pretty close to the exact number of genes in humans, but we still have no idea about the size of the metabolome in most animals. This is an estimate. Uh, it's not uh, guaranteed, but this is a rough estimate on the number of metabolites that we know for different kingdoms of life. So if we look at all plants, there's somewhere between 250,000 to 300,000 is the common number that people bounce around. It's probably more than that. If we look at the, the universe of microbes, um, we can see perhaps 150,000 um, uh, products that microbes code for produce. Any given microbe maybe produces around 5,000 metabolites uh, or compounds, but because they are in such diverse niches around the world, um, the total number of a microbiome metabolome is, is quite large. Mammals, including humans, uh, have relatively smaller metabolomes, uh, but it's still on the order of about 120,000 chemicals or metabolites that have been enumerated so far. So, sorry, David, can I interrupt? Sure. Yeah. Uh, um, if you go back a slide. Um, so in uh, the mammalian metabolome, how can you differentiate from the microbial metabolome? It's really hard. Um, and in fact, there's a lot of overlap between metabolites. And um, uh, you're exactly right. We often can't distinguish, um, except usually by looking at specific organs. So if we look at yeah. uh, feces and things like that, we can generally come up with a better idea about um, um, what are mic microbial, um, but it's still a challenge. Um, there's about a 95% overlap. We know about um, two or 300 metabolites um, in the human metabolome that we are absolutely certain are microbial. And then okay. there's things that are called microbial co-metabolites like hippuric acid, which is a mixture of both the human and the microbial uh, metabolism. But yeah, it's a very and, good point. And, and these numbers I presume are for um, sort of complete, they, they only include the, all the breakdown products. Yeah, I'll be getting into that. So yes, these yeah. are the, the sort of the um, original- The whole molecule. The, yeah, the, the initial molecule. ones there, but there's other yeah. things, yeah, that suggest that the metabolome is probably about 10 times larger than what I'm showing here. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So in terms of what we can track and what's being um, um, kept, and, and a lot of this is in databases that my lab has been maintaining for the last um, 10 or 15 years. Uh, this is the collection that we call the human metabolome. So humans um, have a lot of endogenous metabolites. Um, Actually, the number is probably a little less than 114,000, but they range, as I say, from femtomolar, which is below what we can normally detect, to almost molar ranges. Um, so these are the metabolites encoded by our genes um, and produced by the proteins and enzymes in our body, uh, including some of the microbes. Uh, we take in things. Um, humans eat other metabolomes, and we also take in synthetic things. So. Uh, there's about 2,600 known drugs um, that are approved by Health Canada and the FDA. Um, so um, in humans, we will find drugs. Hopefully you won't find all 2,000 drugs in one person, but in a population, you will find um, a few drugs in a person, and then over several tens of thousands, you probably will get a good portion of those. Drugs tend to be at a higher concentration, uh, but at lower levels than what you'll find in many endogenous metabolites. Um, also in our body, you'll find foods and food metabolites. Um, these can include food additives. They can include sort of the xenobiotic compounds you get from plants, all those polyphenols and terpenoids and alkaloids in the coffee that you're drinking um, or the tea. 
And the diversity of those is also quite large, about 70,000 compounds that we've cataloged in a database called FoodDB. Um, so uh, they are about in the same range of drugs, and this is why many food compounds essentially also act like drugs. Drugs are broken down and they produce drug metabolites. Um, they are at lower concentrations on average than drugs themselves. Some drug metabolites are actually more active than drugs. Some are very harmful. Um, so we track a lot of that information about drugs in a database called Drug Bank. And then there's a whole variety of toxins and environmental chemicals. And there's far more than 3,600 that I've mentioned here, but these are the most toxic ones and uh, the most abundant ones. And we keep uh, those in a database called T3DB or the Toxic Exposome Database. Uh, I'll be talking about other databases later today and they're much, much more uh, in these tools or resources. And again, hopefully in the case of toxins, these are at much, much lower concentrations than food or endogenous metabolites because obviously they're harmful. So a whole range of compounds in the human body from the exposures to drugs, to foods, to endogenous metabolites and spanning many orders of magnitude in terms of concentrations from 10 to the minus 15th to roughly 10 to the minus one molar. Now, we, as I, as I think, Francis highlighted is there's a lot of other um, metabolites that likely exist. Um, and the, the magnitude, at least in the human, um, is quite significant. Um, we can look and think about known lipids or predicted lipids. So there's probably another 100,000 lipids at least that are um, not cataloged in databases. Uh, given what we know about drug metabolism, uh, from the 2,600 known drugs, there should actually be on the order of about 10,000 drug metabolites. So those are some of them predicted, some not known. We also know that the foods, uh, compounds that we take in are also metabolized. So the roughly 70,000 different products that we know in foods are probably multiplied by a factor of six to 10. Uh, and these are food metabolites, um, breakdown products that also produce some strange and interesting compounds. Uh, some of them are done by your liver, some of them are done by the gut. And then there's a whole range of promiscuous re enzyme reactions and other um, metabolites of metabolites. So your endogenous metabolome is processed by your gut and by the liver to produce other secondary metabolites. And I'm calling this the second ohm or secondome, um, but it's essentially another um, collection of, of metabolites that we believe exist. So when you add these up, we're looking at at least another million compounds and probably far more than that, that are probably in your body right now as we speak. So the size of the metabolome um, is still growing and something that is still somewhat ill-defined. Um, does anyone have any questions about that? Because sometimes we do, at least in in-person classes, uh, people have a fair number of questions about these, these numbers. Uh, does anyone want to ask a question? All right, um, I'll carry on. The next one is really just a quick question, address uh, why metabolomics is important. And obviously everyone who's here thinks it is. Um, but there are some interesting statistics about small molecules. Um, when you look at the clinical assays that are run, if you go to the doctor's office or to a hospital, most of the diagnostic clinical assays that are done are for small molecules. Um, so if they're doing a urine test, they're measuring things like glucose or cholesterol or bilirubin or creatinine. Um, we also know that almost 90% of the known drugs are small molecules. Um, they are often derivatives of existing natural products, about half of them. So they're either inspired by natural products that have similar functions, or in some cases, uh, they are the natural products and they're still used as drugs. Um, if we look at the number of genetic disorders that we know in humans, um, about a third of them involve diseases of small molecule metabolism. So yes, they're genetic, but they're also metabolic disorders. And then when we think about the body um, of any organism, ours or other organisms, um, small molecules are the cofactors and signaling molecules for most of the proteins in a cell 
or in our bodies uh, or in other organisms. Uh, and we tend to forget that. Um, we generally look at small molecules as things to be either consumed or destroyed or assembled uh, in catabolism or anabolism. But small molecules play a much, much more important role. One way of looking at them is that metabolites are the canaries of the genome. Uh, a small change, a single mutation in certain, say, uh, phenylalanine um, um, oxidase or synthase genes can lead to um, a disease like phenylketonuria. So one mutation can lead to a 10,000 fold increase in certain metabolite levels. So it allows, or historically, the measurement of small molecules has allowed you to detect genetic changes, which up until relatively recently were almost impossible to detect. Um, so the fact that you can have a single chemical change in DNA amplified to the point where you see a, a 10,000 fold change in, in certain metabolite levels is quite striking. And so this is why the concept of the canary in the coal mine, coal miners use canaries to help detect very low levels of toxic gases um, uh, in the 1800s and early 1900s. Uh, this is how metabolites can serve the same role as being able to detect those changes in the genome. As I mentioned before, what you eat and drink and breathe changes your metabolome. And so in that regard, metabolomics is very time sensitive. So like this person, if you're really hungry and we're eating a lot of spaghetti, what you would see is that if we metabolically measured you, we'd see wild variations and whole range of metabolites. So the first few seconds to the first few minutes to several hours, some going up, some going down, some oscillating. Um, so in that regard, metabolome readout just from eating a meal would be quite impressive. Um, Temporally, if we looked at your proteins, uh, we might see uh, changes of a few proteins, like maybe insulin, ghrelin, a couple other small ones, but there won't be a whole lot of change proteomically um, over that period of time. And then your genome, hopefully, shouldn't change at all based on the meal you ate. Um, so in fact, the genome will change, or should not change at all um, during, after, or over multiple meals. So that time sensitivity makes metabolomics both useful, but also challenging. Because if you aren't designing your experiments to include certain aspects about diet or time after uh, consumption or exposures, uh, that makes the interpretation of metabolomic data um, a little more difficult. Um, likewise, samples um, that you collect, blood or urine or any other tissue from other organisms is metabolically active. Uh, there are enzymes that are converting, there are metabolites that are spontaneously converting, and those change over time. And so if you don't quench or metabolically quench a sample, you're going to get the same readout that I'm getting here in terms of these metabolic responses. So people who tend to collect things for DNA or RNA or protein don't worry about those time changes very much. And sometimes they'll leave samples sitting out for several hours uh, just because they know that DNA or RNA and even the proteins are relatively stable. But you can't do that for metabolomics. Uh, if you collect a sample, you have to quench it fairly quickly, typically within a few minutes, and you have to store it typically frozen if you want to get a real measure of the metabolism. Metabolism is relatively well understood. Um, pathway diagrams existed for metabolism as far back as the 40s and 50s. Uh, this is a picture of one of these wall charts that some of you, if you were born in the 60s or 70s might have seen them when you're in, in university. Some people still have them. But these the, the point is that this was something that was known as far back as the early 70s. These are pictures of metabolism and metabolic pathways. So in that regard, our understanding of metabolism actually is probably better and deeper than it is for um, proteomics and genomics. And this is one of the strengths of metabolomics is that we can go back to a vast body of literature and use that to help interpret and understand uh, the results we measure. Now in the pyramid that I showed you at the beginning of this talk, um, I had these three different um, groupings and colors, the genome, the proteome, and the metabolome. And to a large extent, they still are these uh, silos where we often don't connect. But I think one of the strengths, and um, hidden strengths, I think, of metabolomics is that it helps connect 
the other ohms that in order to understand a pathway, a metabolic pathway, you have to know something about the enzymes. And to know about those enzymes, you have to know about the proteins and also the genes. And so people doing metabolomics inherently have to understand or integrate both proteomics and genomics. Now people doing genomics don't necessarily have to think about the metabolome. Uh, they can focus on the genome or the transcriptome. And in many cases, people doing proteomics also don't think a lot about small molecules. They're not measuring them. Um, but I think more and more, uh, and as many of you are seeing, uh, it's important to be able to connect these three different ohms together. Um, so when we look at the connection, we can think about the small molecules from AMP and TMP and ATP are all the constituents of um, the the genome and the transcriptome, they are the nucleotides and nucleosides. The amino acids, of course, are the constituents of the proteome. Um, they all have to be strung together to make um, proteins. The lipids or the lipidome um, are responsible for giving cells their shape, integrity, and structure, so they're crucial. So the small molecules make the genome, the small molecules make the proteome, the small molecules make the lipidome. Um, they are also the source of all energy in our cells or any cell. They need the sugars, the lipids, amino acids, and ATP. Um, and then, of course, I've mentioned the importance of many small molecules as cofactors and signaling molecules. What people don't often realize, and this is sometimes considered scandalous if you walk into a room of geneticists, um, but the genome and the proteome largely evolved to catalyze chemistry of small molecules. It is um, likely that the very first, what we might call living organisms, didn't have much either in terms of either DNA or RNA. They were just simply uh, a collection of chemical reactions uh, that allowed other things to proceed uh, in some enclosed body uh, or cell. And so what genes and proteins did uh, is that they emerged to help speed up the chemical reactions that were essential to life. So the chemicals really drove the evolution of the DNA, the genome, and the proteome. The other thing that we're trying to do in this modern world is, is something we call integrative biology or systems biology. And that uh, collection of different silos of genomics and proteomics and metabolomics needs to be integrated, and we call it systems biology or integrative biology. And the way to do that is to use tools like bioinformatics. And what you're gonna learn about in the next few days is cheminformatics. And there are two related branches, one primarily to deal with genes and proteins, and the other one to deal with, with small molecules. But even bioinformatics and cheminformatics are subsuming each other. The applications of metabolomics are diverse. Uh, many of you are using it in, in microbiome research, some of it in environmental metabolomics, some in cancer, um, some in, in um, a variety of organisms from small to large. Um, metabolomics really got its start in the world of genetic disease tests. Many of the first chemical or metabolite tests were specifically for them. Uh, food analysis and food chemistry uh, uses metabolomics a lot. All the clinical tests, whether it's in blood or urinalysis, use a lot of the instruments in metabolomics. Um, drug compliance um, and drug monitoring, transplant monitoring, looking at the, the drugs and levels that you see in people with um, organ transplants. Uh, imaging, CAT scanning, magnetic resonance imaging. These use chemical shift imaging uh, or PET scanning to see uh, specific metabolites. Tox testing, clinical trial work, fermentation monitoring is becoming bigger and bigger, whether it's for wine and beer, but also for the production of, of pharmaceuticals. Um, drug phenotyping, water quality testing, petrochemical analysis, uh, the list goes on and on. So this is why basically we've been seeing more and more people enrolling into these metabolomics courses and more people from more diverse backgrounds realizing that metabolites are are really useful and that it's not just about metabolites, but it's about all of, of the chemical universe that our, our world is immersed in. Um, so I'm gonna dive in, switch over to metabolomics methods, but I'll 
stop here briefly to find out if there are any questions that people have about uh, what I've just talked about. Everything's at about, about the right pace, or am I going a little too fast? Not getting a lot of feedback, so I assume I'm, I'm not talking just to myself. If it's okay, put the, the green tick at least. Yes. Uh, yeah, thumbs up. Yeah, I enjoy it. I'm just listening. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> All right. Jeff, it's not for you, though. We're going to dive into the workflow a little bit. Um, and um, the, um, this is trying to describe the processes by which we do metabolomics. And for some of you, this is old hat, uh, so you might fall asleep. But for a number of you, based on your introductions, uh, this will be kind of nude for you. And so I'll, I'll we'll dive into it. Um, and hopefully get everyone up to about the same, same speed. So in metabolomics, we start with often biological uh, samples. Sometimes we'll start with cells. Uh, we can start with soil. We can start with tissues, organs, plants, animals, whatever we want, actually. Um, but we usually convert those solid things into uh, liquids. So we might use uh, a sonicator. We'll do some kind of solvent extraction. And what you're doing is, is you have to work quickly. We talked about this idea of metabolic quenching. So it's important um, so that the enzymes aren't converting all those metabolites into something else. Um, so the extraction will produce a fluid. Now we can save ourselves a lot of effort if we collect fluids directly. So in the case of animals and humans, we can get um, you know, blood or urine and that's a, a lot faster. Um, if we do a tissue extraction on an organ, we'll get something that kind of looks like blood. Um, or tissue lysis. Um, but in the end, what we're trying to do is create a, a set of, of liquid samples, uh, whether they're extracted um, components or the actual biofluids, because working with liquids is, is really best for chemical analyzers. And the chemical analysis we typically do in metabolomics is either uh, liquid chromatography, gas chromatography, mass spectrometry, NMR spectroscopy, a range of other things. And so the chemical analysis we do in metabolomics is largely looking at mixtures. Uh, we don't usually look at pure compounds, um, but we've got a collection of mixtures. And so what we have or what I'm showing is, um, is just the tools, but, but what metabolomics, I guess the, the technological leap that happened wasn't the introduction of mass spec or NMR, which have been around for 60, 70 years. Um, it was the introduction of data tools. Um, it's this arrow here that allowed people to go from analyzing a single molecule at a time to dozens to hundreds and even thousands. So a lot of the strength in metabolomics isn't necessarily in the technology, but it's in the software. And this is why this course is being taught. But it's important that you understand how to look at and use the technology. And so we're gonna focus on this for the next hour and then this for the next day and a half. So when we look at um, the different ohms and the different ohmic techniques um, with genomics through next generation sequencing, it's pretty routine to be able to sequence an entire organism. So human, 22,000 genes, uh, microbes around four or 5,000 genes. With proteomics, uh, with different techniques, you can get up to around eight to 10,000 proteins. So not quite as many of proteins as all the genes. And we know that genes code for probably around, at least in humans, about 100,000 different proteins. So proteomics doesn't give us all the coverage we expect. Uh, a typical metabolomics run, um, if you're doing a pretty good job, uh, will allow you to identify about 200 metabolites. Some techniques that can get a little higher, uh, but whether it's targeted or untargeted, most people are happy if they can identify that number. So in terms of the coverage with omics right now, um, if you want something that's really complete, go to genomics. Um, metabolomics still has a long way to go. Um, and so as you go up this pyramid, the completeness of coverage is still uh, woefully weak in the field of metabolomics. We'll talk about some of the techniques that are improving that or can improve that. Um, but um, uh, we'll leave it at that and just say that there's rather limited coverage that metabolome offers. 
reason why is because uh, it has to do with the complexity of the chemistry. Uh, sequencing genes means you only have to analyze four different bases, and we really understand the chemistry of those bases, and the fact that they are in polymers also makes it easy. Proteins are made up of 20 uh, amino acids, uh, pro proteins, and, and so the chemistry in proteins is a little more complicated, and that's why we can't sequence proteins quite as easily as we can sequence DNA. In the case of metabolites, we're dealing with hundreds of thousands of different chemicals and around three to 4,000 different chemical classes. So to look at that wide diversity of chemicals and chemical classes intrinsically makes metabolomics more difficult. This is why we have to use a whole bunch of different techniques and tools and platforms to figure out what we're seeing. So the techniques in metabolomics include chromatography, uh, they include capillary electrophoresis and microfluidics. They include liquid chromatography mass set. They use a variety of mass platforms, triple quad, TOFs, Fourier transform. You can also use gas chromatography and GCMS, um, infrared spectroscopy, NMR spectroscopy, uh, crystallography. There's even efforts now using electron crystallography or electron microscopy to identify metabolites. So an incredible diversity of techniques to, just to be able to handle the wide diversity of chemical classes that you see. None of us can be experts in all of these, but to do metabolomics comprehensively, you often have to access uh, these. And this is why um, a lot of centers have emerged, uh, which offer essentially all of these techniques. Um, so Metabolomics Innovation Center, which is one that I run, um, offers most of these technologies right now. So in terms of chromatography, uh, this is a separation process to separate small molecules. And chromatography is often coupled to liquid chromatography MS, GCMS. It's an old technique. It's been around for more than 100 years um, and uh, traditionally used to separate um, chemicals for organic synthesis. On the right, you're seeing an example of a chromatogram of what you can see as you separate individual molecules and the peaks corresponding to them. So typically, the definition of chromatography is to take something, a mixture, and pass it through that or have that dissolved in a mobile phase, a solvent, could be water, or acetonitrile, methanol, um, and then to pass that through a stationary phase, which is usually a powder or a, a mixture of certain molecules. And as it passes, this, the mobile fa phase passes to the stationary phase, things separate based on their interaction with the stationary phase. They partition between the mobile and stationary phase. So with chromatography, you can have column chromatography, thin layer chromatography, gas or liquid. Uh, you can have affinity chromatography, ion exchange, size exclusion, reverse, normal. Uh, hydrophobic interaction or hydrophilic interaction and gravity, high pressure, and so on. These are all the techniques that are used and the type and methods can vary tremendously. Most people use high pressure or high performance liquid chromatography in metabolomics. This has been around for about 50 years. You use uh, relatively high pressure, 6,000 pounds per square inch, and very small particles, about five microns. Um, uh, to fill the column, that's the stationary phase. Um, but with the high pressure, um, you're able to get greater separation. Uh, you're also able to detect things uh, because you're able to use much smaller columns. Um, and in some cases, people can detect things at a parts per trillion level. Uh, you can adjust and modify high pressure chromatography to separate polar compounds in things like HILIC, H-I-L-I-C, or nonpolar compounds in reverse phase. So the different modalities, uh, modalities are a reverse phase for nonpolar, um, and it uses a nonpolar stationary phase, uh, aliphatic um, compounds attached to a uh, bead substrate. The normal phase, which is not that commonly used anymore. Um, and then HILIC, um, hydrophobic interaction, liquid chromatography was what it stands for. And it uses a polar stationary phase and a mixed polar, nonpolar, mobile phase. But this is ideal for separating polar molecules, which are quite common in biofluids and tissues. 
As I mentioned, the columns are generally small and designed to sustain very high pressure. Um, most of them are made out of uh, stainless steel. Some can be made out of a form of plastic called peak. Very few now are made out of glass. Um, they can be analytical or preparative. Analyticals are the most common ones, um, very small columns, um, very narrow. Preparative columns are used to prepare things in large scale. So if you're a natural product chemist, you typically use preparative HPLC columns. Um, dimensions are given here, one to 50 millimeters inside and about to some of them up to half a meter long, but most are much smaller on the order of about um, 20 or 30 centimeters. So reverse phase column is typically made up of uh, silica beads, five microns in diameter typically, and they're typically de decorated with hydrophobic, uh, either aliphatic, so a, a C16 or a C18 or a C4 column, tells you the number of carbons that are on the aliphatic chains that are attached to the silica beads. Uh, and so you can change or modify those um, lipids or fatty acids or alkanes that you stuck onto them with things that are aromatic. Um, so you can have a biphenyl group. Um, you can also have this diphenyl benzene. All kinds of column substrates can be attached to change what you're gonna be separating. And essentially you have to remember like dissolves like. So an alkane prefers interacting with an alkane. A biphenyl prefers interacting with aromatic molecules. A cyano group prefers interacting with sort of polar groups. Um, so these are things that you can do to modify uh, what's in your column. So you can play around with the separation efficiency by either adjusting the length of your column. So a longer column, which takes more time, uh, will give you better separation. Uh, you can also adjust um, the, the bead size. So smaller beads will also give you better separation. Now, when you get smaller beads, you actually have to use much higher pressures. And so the development that happened over the last 10 years was to switch from five micron beads and HPLC, 1.7 micron beads and UPLC or ultra high pressure. So let's say simple tricks, either longer separation times or smaller beads and higher pressures. Um, typically an HPLC separation, um, is done where you'll have a solvent, um, let's just immobile phase, you'll have a pump that uh, provides the high pressure. Uh, you'll have an injector, um, which will allow you to insert or inject your sample. The column will be used, it separates the material in the mixture, and then you'll have some kind of detector. So it could be a UV detector, a fluorescence detector, or a mass spec detector. Even an NMR can be attached to an HPLC or UPLC. And that is then connected to a computer. And then of course the solvent is either collected or uh, sent off to waste. You can get mo more enhanced or improved separations if you use more than one solvent. You can use two solvents. Uh, you can even use three solvents and you create a gradient or a mixture. And by changing the solvent, the mobile phase over time, uh, you're able to enhance the separation. Generally, you can't change the column over time, but certainly the solvent can. And so by changing the solvent, you can either improve um, or enhance um, the separation, um, improve in some cases the resolution. Um, and, and a lot of work is done by different groups to play around with the different mixtures and optimizing the solvents or mobile phase to, to get better separations. This is a picture, a typical um, diagram of a chromatogram where you've got a, a biological mixture of probably several hundred components, maybe even several thousand components running on an HPLC column for about 50 minutes. And that's a long separation. And many people in, in metabolomics like to get separations down to 10 or 12 minutes using UPLC. Um, and what we're seeing is the intensity, milliabsorbance units. So this is a, a UV HPLC separation. And the peaks correspond to individual chemicals, or in some cases, dozens of chemicals under a peak. Uh, 
Um, but this is why separation is important in that it helps simplify the mixture um, to either individual compounds or a small number of compounds that can then be analyzed by mass spec or NMR. Another form of chromatography is gas chromatography. So in this case, the mobile phase is not a liquid, it's a gas. And typically um, gas chromatography occurs um, with a column, a very long column in an oven, relatively high temperatures. And you can change the temperature of the oven, just like you can change the solvent. So the oven temperature is a, a technique, not unlike in liquid chromatography where you have gradient um, liquids, um, changing the oven and the temperature allows you to um, um, give, create a gradient and improve the separation in gas chromatography. Uh, you can have a flame ionization detector, uh, or you can have a mass spec detector in gas chromatography. Um, so this is why we got the term GCMS. So for gas chromatography to work, the sample has to be vaporized. It has to be something that um, boils reasonably well um, and it's relatively stable to temperature. Uh, it moves through the column and it's pushed by a gas, uh, usually hydrogen or argon. Um, and then the column itself um, isn't packed with beads, but it's actually a hollow column um, where they're again, um, certain chemicals are attached to the surface of the column and you're getting uh, interactions of the, the small molecules with the surface, uh, just like small molecules interact with the beads and the aliphatic or hydrophilic components in, in liquid chromatography column. The columns are very, very long, usually around 10 meters in length, not on the order of 20 centimeters as in HPLC. And the inside diameter is also tiny, uh, a few millimeters whereas most HPLC columns are uh, measured more like a centimeter in, in diameter. Um, in order to make compounds um, boil or vaporize, sometimes we will derivatize them or often we have to. And derivatization is a technique that's critical to GCMS. Um, we can either use a technique or compound with methoxamine uh, which is used to sort of open up some sugars and to um, um, react with uh, certain uh, aldehydes or ketones. And then we can also do silation, which is attaching trimethyl silane groups to hydroxyl or carboxylate or amino groups. Um, this chemical derivatization um, allows many compounds that are not otherwise uh, susceptible to heating or boiling or vaporizing to be vaporizable. Now there's some liquids, um, certain terpenes, alkanes, alkaloids that also will don't need derivatization. Uh, many of the flavor components in food um, don't need derivatization, um, but many other metabolites like amino acids many sugars, most organic acids, fatty acids have to be derivatized. So if you start with a mixture of compounds and they've been derivatized, you push it through your column and the gas flow, the helium, allows just like acetonitrile, methanol or water in a liquid column uh, to separate things. And um, you will have high affinity, those things move more slowly and low affinity, those things uh, move more quickly. Um, and they flow towards the detector. And below is a picture of a, a gas chromatogram. And typically they take about 45 minutes to run. So they're not as fast as UPLC. Uh, but the resolution you get with gas chromatography is much, much better. If you look at a gas chromatography column, they're not typically straight. They're wound in a coil and inserted in a cubicle oven. Uh, if you look on the inside, you'll see that they're um, essentially coated. Um, they're hollow tubes um, with a polysiloxane uh, coating. Uh, that's a mixture, there's this fused silica uh, with the stationary phase of the polysilo polysiloxane. And that can be methyl or benzyl groups, uh, which the metabolites or chemicals interact with. Now in liquid chromatography, and in gas chromatography, we measure how long compounds take to come off. 
And so that's called the retention time or RT. So in a liquid co column, liquid chromatography, how long, how many minutes um, or seconds for something to start coming off um, is, is a measure of either how hydrophilic or how hydrophobic it is. Um, it's affected by the column type. It's affected by the, um, the flow rates, the pressure, the temperature in the case of um, gas chromatography. Um, so there's many variables that go into it. So it's not something that is easily predicted, nor is it something that's consistent, at least for liquid chromatography. But if you use a standard retention, standard column, standard separation process, um, certain labs will develop uh, a, a way of comparing or standardizing retention times. In gas chromatography, it turns out things are much more standardized than in liquid chromatography. And in fact, there's now a standard protocol in gas chromatography called the retention index and the COVATS, K-O-V-A-T-S, retention index, which can be pretty much universally used. And this is the retention time in a gas column normalized to the retention time of a bunch of alkanes, usually six or seven alkanes of different carbon lengths from say C6 to C15. So by standardizing retention times to standard columns and standard alkanes, um, gas chromatography has actually leapt far ahead of liquid chromatography in being able to use retention time information to identify compounds. Now, whether it's liquid chromatography or gas chromatography, um, the same sort of spectrum or chromatogram is generated. Um, you look at that time. So in this says you've got something coming off at 2.85 minutes. Um, and then you have a peak and the intensity of the peak either is measured by ultraviolet, um, infrared fluorescence or mass spec, or even NMR tells you how much. So the intensity um, is for quantitation, both absolute and relative. And then the retention time if you use it properly, can be used as a consistent measure to identify a compound. So if this compound always comes off at 2.85 minutes, plus or minus 10%, you can be pretty certain what the compound is without actually having to do a detailed MS or even NMR analysis. As I mentioned, gas chromatography uh, gives you much nicer and better separations than liquid chromatography. You can see the very, very narrow peaks uh, that you see with gas chromatography. These are peaks that have been annotated. Uh, in many cases, the peak corresponds to a single compound. Sometimes there's a couple of compounds that coalute. But the separation for gas chromatography is, is really quite spectacular. And for many labs, uh, GCMS is the preferred way to do metabolomics because it's cheaper and the separations are, are actually predictable. Now, liquid chromatography and mass spectrometry are coupled to detectors. And in many cases, one of the best detectors is a mass spectrometer. So in mass spectrometry, um, we try and weigh uh, or measure the molecular atomic weight of samples. Uh, so that's fundamentally what we're using to distinguish or identify things. And it's basically saying that if we had a list of everyone's weight in this class, uh, and then we you know, were blinded, but all we could see was how much you weighed on a weigh scale. In essence, we could identify everyone in the class unless one or two of you had exactly the same molecular weight. But molecular weight alone is often sufficient to identify um, people as well as molecules. So mass spectrometers are expensive. Um, they're often fairly big. This is an example of an Orbitrap mass spectrometer coupled to a liquid chromatography system. Just as I said, different molecules, uh, just like different people can be identified by their weights. And unlike humans who can go on diets, uh, molecules don't. And so the weight stays the same um, based on its structure. So these are different structures, different molecules. They have very characteristic, very specific molecular weights. And so it's a simple idea. And in fact, the idea has been around for more than 120 years to identify molecules based on their masses. If you've got a, an Orbitrap mass spectrometer or a QTOF, uh, you can measure the molecular weight 
to within about one ppm, one part per million, which is actually sufficient to determine the molecular formula of a small molecule. And the molecular formula tells you a fair bit. Now, if you're looking at proteins, um, you can determine things down to maybe about one Dalton for say a 40 kilodalton protein, which is pretty good. Um, um, and that's also been used to identify proteins, although not with the same accuracy. So one Dalton is equal to one atomic mass unit or one AMU. And so we'll flip back and forth between AMUs and Daltons. So we couple um, columns uh, to mass spectrometers. So we can have a GCMS, we can have LCMS. So most of you have heard those terms before, but you can also couple mass spectrometers to each other. So an MSMS -MS, uh, is not unlike an LCMS, but it, it essentially separates masses um, um, by mass uh, in two different ways. One is to um, fragment a parent ion and to separate them into smaller fragment ions. So tandem mass spectrometry. Now with mass spectrometry, you can get um, accurate masses or average masses. Um, so lower resolution mass spectrometers, um, like a triple quad or a linear ion trap, um, produce an average mass, uh, on a fairly broad peak, um, and they're able to get to about one Dalton or 0.3 Dalton resolution. A high resolution mass spectrometer can measure the monoisotopic mass. And because they're different isotopes, uh, you will see different levels of abundance for different um, isotopomers. So this is a picture showing a molecule that has a molecular weight of about 1155 Daltons. The average mass would come out to a, a big peak, broad peak of 1156 Daltons. But if we have a high resolution machine, we'll see things that will have the single monoisotope, uh, carbon 12, uh, hydrogen 1, uh, oxygen 16, but then we'll see other isotopes with carbon 13 or nitrogen 15 or combinations of carbon plus nitrogen or deuterium. And so we will see diminishing intensities corresponding to the abundance of those isotopomers. And we can see the individual masses. So let's take a benzyl chloride where we've got these known abundances for hydrogen, deuterium, carbon 12, carbon 13, and chlorine 35 and chlorine 37. So the monoisotopic mass, the, the most abundant one is 112 Daltons. And that would include carbon 12, hydrogen, and chlorine 35. Um, one Dalton higher, 113 Daltons, would include the carbon 12, but also it can also have um, some carbon 13, or it can have um, uh, deuterium. Uh, and that would give you enough. And based on the abundance of the percentages up there, you can predict there'd be an intensity of about uh, six. But then two Daltons, um, we have a um, case of uh, two, either two carbon 13s or two deuteriums or one chlorine 37. And because chlorine 37 is quite abundant, a uh, quite abundant isotopomer, uh, we get a big peak uh, of about 32%. And then you can get other combinations. So this is how you can use isotopes to, in some cases, figure out the formula, but also identify whether you have something that has chlorine. So this is what we would see in a mass spectrometer um, with this pluribenzene. We'd see a, a peak at 112 Daltons, and then we'd see a fairly significant peak at 114 Daltons with about a third of the intensity. And then we'd see other ones um, further down with lower intensities based on the isotopic abundance. So mass specs, uh, use uh, an ionization te technique to convert molecules so that they're charged. We can't measure the mass of neutral molecules. Um, we have to charge them. And so mass spectrometry uses an ionizer and there are different ways of ionizing things. Most use electrospray or electron impact. And once something is ionized, it has charges and then it goes into a mass analyzer like a TOF or a quad or an Orbi trap. 
and then it's sent off to a detector to produce a signal. So if we're looking at an MS-MS spectrum where something has been fragmented um, or an electron impact spectrum from a GCMS, we will see fragment ions. So this is the parent ion. So the parent ion has a molecular weight of aspirin about 180 Daltons, but then we see smaller fragments at 140, 120, around 91 and 42 Daltons that correspond to um, fragments of aspirin. So unlike liquid chromatography or even gas chromatography, a mass spectrum is characterized by very sharp peaks. So the x-axis indicates the mass to charge ratio and the height of the peak indicates the relative abundance. Now the intensity of a peak in mass spec is not very useful for getting actual concentrations. Um, it's the intensity is really a measure of an ion's ability to ionize or fly in the mass spectrometer. So predicting and interpreting intensities in mass spec is difficult. It's not like NMR, if some of you know it, or it's not like liquid chromatography or gas chromatography where a big peak means there's a lot of material. A big peak in mass spec may not mean that there's a lot of that ion. It just means that it ionizes well. So in mass spec, um, because peaks are narrow, uh, especially in high resolution, we have something called the resolving power or resolution. So the better the resolving power, the more expensive the instrument and the more accurate the mass. So we define it by essentially a mass relative to the mass difference or M over delta M. Um, so delta M is the difference between two masses that can be separated. And the mass is the actual measurement of the mass or mass to charge we measure. So when you think about resolution, you can think of a peak sort of looking a bit like a triangle. Uh, delta M is sort of, a, if you want the width, and it could be the width at either 50% or at 5% of the height. Um, and so what you're seeing are examples where we're resolving two peaks. Um, typically humans and machines can resolve peaks at about 50%. Uh, it's pretty easy for anyone to resolve peaks at the 5% or 10% separation. So as I mentioned, there are certain types of mass analyzers that have uh, low or high resolution. So an ion trap, a linear ion trap, or a triple quad typically can only measure masses at, a, at one Dalton or half a Dalton resolution. So you will see typically an average mass for a molecule and they produce this broad kind of ugly looking peak. If you use a time of flight mass spectrometer or an Orbi trap or an FTMS instrument as an analyzer, you get much higher resolution. You can see things at the you know, levels of two, three and four decimal places. And so in this case, we're seeing a mass, this is actually for a peptide, but for even a small molecule, we'd see the same sort of thing where you're seeing uh, a bunch of peaks, uh, all corresponding to those individual uh, isotopomers. So a low resolution to a high resolution instrument. And this is just illustrating again, the resolving power for, for different instruments and the resolving power um, for uh, a lower resolution instrument um, and a higher resolution instrument. Um, so, with the blue broad peak, that's what you'd see for a triple quad, resolving power of about a thousand. Um, for a QTOF or a modest Orbi trap, you would see something in the black, which is a resolving power of around 30,000. And you can see those peaks are very, very distinct. Um, and that obviously means you can get a lot of information from very narrow peaks. So mass spectrometers um, have uh, an ionizer, it's called an ion source um, that's marked in yellow. They can be electrospray, ion spray, atmospheric pressure ionization, electron impact, chemical impact. Uh, they all run high vacuum systems uh, to help make sure that there's nothing contaminating um, the ions because you're working with small numbers of molecules. We've talked about how LC and GC send these things into the mass spectrometers but they still have to be ionized. So in terms of different ionization methods, uh, we can use um, 
EI for GCMS, CI for GCMS, typically have lower um, mass limits, usually around 700 Daltons is the max. Um, some are called hard ionization methods like electron impact, and some are soft ionization uh, methods like electrospray or ESI or MALDI. And ESI is the most common method for ionizing in LCMS. And it's used not only for metabolomics, but also proteomics. You can also use MALDI um, as a way of ionizing uh, samples. And this is used in metabolomic imaging. So the electron impact ionization uh, uses a standard uh, powered electron gun that sends things at electrons at 70, 70 volts or 70 electron volts. So when a set of molecules is fed in from a gas chromatography instrument, the gas floats into this ionizer. Uh, an electron gun, not unlike a cathode ray tube with the old TVs, uh, is fired and it shatters the, the molecules into their fragments and those fragments uh, all typically have positive ions and they are sent into the mass analyzer, usually a single quad mass spec. So it's a very standard approach to ionizing and it fragments things into very tiny uh, fragments. Um, so the sample is already evaporated, it exists, it's in the gas phase, you hit it uh, with um, these electrons, they're shattered, uh, or shattered the molecule, and then, as I said, it's the one used in GCMS. So if you're fragmenting a molecule like ethanol, you'll see, or methanol, you'll see the methanol parent molecule, but then you'll see things that have lost the hydroxyl group, things that have lost uh, other hydrogens. So you'll see a range of masses, uh, including the parent ion. And so this is an example where we're seeing methanol with a parent ion of 32, a loss of a single hydrogen uh, to, this, to produce this stable or ionized uh, double bonded form at 31. Uh, the sort of pseudo aldehyde at 29, um, and then you'll see the methyl group at 15. So these are uh, the fragments. And in fact, people who are pretty skilled in GCMS have a pretty good idea uh, of how um, molecules will break up in their predictive or in a predictive way. And so this is how you can actually figure out the chemical structure of small molecules. Now the soft ionizations like MALDI and ESI use different things. MALDI uses a laser, ESI uses essentially um, um, a gold tipped hollow needle in a, in a high um, electrical field to ionize things. So you spray things out kind of like on an aerosol can um, and it produces a, a, a mist or a spray. Um, you have electrodes that surround it. Um, and that actually helps uh, ionize the spray uh, to add charges. Um, and then things are sent from a relatively high pressure, atmospheric pressure, to something that's very, very low pressure. And that also helps to evaporate the spray uh, down to um, essentially something that is visible to essentially something that's invisible. So if you could look at it, uh, you'd see these droplets coming out of your aerosol sprayer. Uh, the capillary has this high charge, which helps ionize the, the spray. But as it moves from atmosphere to low pressure, it starts evaporating. So the acetonitrile methanol water disappears quickly. And as it shrinks, as this droplet shrinks, which contains many ions, they burst off into tiny single ions. And now you have single ions floating through uh, the mass analyzer off to be detected. So in electrospray, you have to have something that usually a fairly volatile buffer. You don't want salts. You have to pump it through a capillary at a relatively low rate of microliters per minute. You apply a really strong um, voltage to this aerosol, a nebulizer uh, to aerosol, aerosolize things. And then as things evaporate, these tiny droplets still carry charges. So you can play around with the, the voltage to enhance the spraying. And you can also play around with the the viscosity of the solvent to enhance the spraying. And these are just sort of showing some conditions depending on which voltage you use. And then at some point, if you have the right condition, uh, things start spraying nicely and uh, produce a really nice signal. You can go from micro spray to nano spray. If you use nano spray, this is ideal for proteomics. For like micro spray, it's ideal for metabolomics. You can get away with a very tiny amount of material. Um, but 
if you put in or happen to put in salts or detergents, it can really mess up your performance. Um, you can change the mode from positive ions uh, to negative ions, and that depends on the solvent that you're using or mixing with your LC system um, to produce either positive or negative ions. So after you've ionized something in a, for a mass spectrometer, you now have these tiny ions flowing through their, their molecules or fragments of molecules. Um, and um, if they just existed in space, we wouldn't be able to see them. So we want to be able to analyze and detect them. And so each mass spectrometer, in addition to an ion source, also has a mass analyzer and a detector. And what most people label a mass spectrometer by is uh, by the mass analyzer. So someone has a QTOF, or they have an Orbi trap, or they have an ion trap. That's how they refer to their mass spectrometers, and that fundamentally is the mass analyzer. So the first mass spectrometers used magnets, and they were called magnet sector analyzers. Uh, they actually give really high resolution, but almost no one uses them anymore. What we did now use instead of magnets is we use electric fields, because we can control them better. Um, and so among the first and most common mass spectrometers that are used in GCMS and in MSMS are quadrupole analyzers. That's marked with a Q. They have low resolution, they're very robust, they're very fast, and they're much cheaper than most other mass spectrometers. Time of flight mass spectrometers have been around for a few decades. Um, they have a very high resolution. Uh, they can also be relatively high throughput. And sometimes these are coupled to a quadrupole and so you'll have a QTOF, quadrupole time of flight, or a time of flight, time of flight uh, is another me method. One of the more popular mass spectrometers these days is called an Orbi trap. It has among the highest resolution, it's generally higher than time of flight. Uh, you can work with small molecules and big molecules, so you can do proteomics as well. Uh, and they actually tend to perform or outperform uh, what used to be, or still is, the highest resolution mass spectrometer called an ion cyclotron resonance, or an FTMS. Uh, these are incredibly expensive and huge machines. Um, they're relatively slow um, in terms of their data uh, collection, um, but they are um, very, very useful uh, for uh, applications requiring very, very high mass resolution. So in terms of their mass accuracy or mass resolving power, we talk about things like parts per million, where we calculate the experimental versus the actual calculated mass and compare it. So FTMS and Orbi traps, we can measure down to one ppm or less. Time of flight, um, mass spectrometers around three to five ppm. Um, I think there's a mistake here, but generally um, quadrupole and ion traps have a uh, a resolution of about 100 ppm, although you can tweak them uh, to get higher resolution under certain circumstances. But quads and ion traps are low resolution, TOFs, Orbi traps, and FTMS are high resolution measured on one ppm accuracy. So when you collect uh, data from an LCMS or GCMS experiment, you will get um, essentially chromatograms uh, that are sort of coupled with not only your LC, but also your MS. So you can get a total ion current chromatogram, a base peak chromatogram, or an extracted ion chromatogram. And a total ion current reflects all of the ions from all of the peaks coming from the whole um, HPLC or GC run. And they're kind of ugly. Uh, and that's shown in red on the left corner. The base peak chromatogram uh, is more appealing and it's one that essentially shows you more about the uh, compounds that you're detecting. So we're not using UV to detect things, we're using the mass spectrometer to detect things. And this would be the equivalent to a nicely resolved LC or GC chromatogram. And that's the middle one, that's the blue one. Then the extracted ion chromatogram um, has this one where we've just extracted a single or a couple of molecules uh, from the TIC or the base peak chromatogram. And this is one where you're just wanting to analyze or identify a specific molecule. Each of these can be electronically um, extracted um, from uh, an LC or GCMS 
So this is uh, an extracted uh, ion chromatogram from, or not an extracted ion chromatogram, but a base peak chromatogram from an LCMS run where we're seeing individual peaks with individual masses identified. So we're seeing retention times above and masses below um, for these specific um, compounds from tomato or Arabidopsis. Now I'm looking at our time, we're a little over time when we started about 15 minutes later than I'd hoped, um, but I'll try and move quickly just so we can get through the rest of the material. So I've talked about mass chroma, mass spectroscopy and liquid chromatography and gas chromatography. I'm gonna talk about another technique that's used in, in metabolomics called NMR. And I think there was only one or two of you who indicated you have done NMR. Um, when we first started teaching this course, about half the class was NMR. These days, it's usually about 10% um, of the class does NMR. But we still talk about it because it is a technique that's still very useful. So NMR uses a, a giant magnet, um, a superconducting magnet, and it collects spectra that look like this. Um, they look a little bit like a, a, a GC chromatogram. They look like a, an extracted ion chromatogram or a base peak chromatogram. Um, so instead of showing retention time, they show chemical shift and you have peaks that are narrow of varying intensity. In NMR, we put a sample under a very strong magnetic field. The magnets are about the size of a refrigerator and they have the strength to pick up a city bus. So they're some of the strongest magnets in the world. And when you put a uh, sample, liquid sample under strong magnetic field, it becomes very sensitive to radio frequency radiation. So if you send in a pulse of radio waves, they will be absorbed by the sample. And by measuring the absorption spectrum, just like when you measure a UV absorption spectrum, you'll see absorbed lines at specific frequencies or chemical shifts. So the frequency and chemical shift are the same. Um, and so you'll see absorption bands. And this is an example of the absorption bands for an NMR sample. And those are the peaks that we see. In NMR, uh, it's not a radioactive thing. We are measuring nuclear magnetism. So it's not about fusion and fission, it's just nuclear magnetism. It's non-radioactive and we're testing the changes or probing the changes in nuclear magnetism. So all molecules have nuclei because all molecules are made of atoms and atoms have nuclei. We use light, but the light is not visible. So the light is radio frequency light. And we measure how these absorb uh, and change the nuclear spins. You can only detect an NMR signal when you put something in a really strong field. At zero field, there's essentially no absorption happening. Different nuclei, carbon nuclei, hydrogen nuclei, deuterium nuclei, absorb at different frequencies. Those nuclei can have spins. They are tiny little um, um, balls basically spinning in space and they spin either right or left or up or down. Um, so all protons and neutrons have a spin, but protons, because they have a positive charge, when you spin a charge, um, around, it pr produces actually a little magnet. So protons, which are in the nucleus, when they spin, create a little mini magnet. And either the North Pole points up or the North Pole points down. And so that's how we know when something has a spin up or a spin down. So at a sample, you're gonna have billions of nuclei, trillions of nuclei with all these things, protons spinning, some up, some down. And when we shine some light or send in a radio frequency um, radio signal, uh, which is still electromagnetic radiation, it will reorient or cause some of those uh, nuclei to flip. Some will go up and others will stay down. So we go from a low energy state to a high energy state where we have more of these red balls, more nuclei that have spin, we're spinning up or have gone to a high energy. So I think there's usually some kind of um, little video here, but I don't think this one works. Um, so we have all these nuclei, they're all spinning. And when they're all oriented, they, they spin up and then they start spinning back down. And it's a little bit like a whole bunch of bells ringing at different frequencies. So if you can think of a carillon where they've got the bells in a church and they're ringing, some are big bells, some are small bells, they have different frequencies and they're all ringing at the same time. So that's what we're detecting in NMR. So that, that 
spin flip produces a ringing. And that ringing is what we detect in NMR. And we detect that from many different nuclei corresponding to all the atoms in the molecule. So big bells have low frequencies, little bells have high frequencies, and it's the same with nuclei. Some are big, some are small, and they all differ by different uh, frequencies. And so this is what actually what we get. This is what's measured by NMR. It looks like an oscilloscope readout. Uh, if someone's speaking or talking, you get the same sort of signal. But this ringing is something that can be converted using something called a Fourier transform. So it converts the free induction decay, the ringing, which is a measurement of change in time to something that goes to a signal in frequency. So the oscillations are converted to frequencies and we see now bands or peaks corresponding to the frequencies. So that's what we actually interpret. So those liquid chromatography like signals are essentially started from a, um, a free induction decay and a mathematical transformation to produce the NMR spectrum. In NMR, we need big magnets. The bigger, the better. The stronger magnets produce higher frequency measurements. And that means greater separation of the signals. So just like with a, a big column or a long column in HPLC separates the signals, a big magnet separates the signals in NMR better. So with modern NMR, we can take a sample, load it up, liquid, it goes into this big magnet, which can pick up a city bus. It's connected to a radio wave transmitter that sends in the, the electromagnetic radio waves and detects the electromagnetic radio waves. The ringing is then sent from the transceiver to a computer, which then does the Fourier transform to convert it into the spectrum that we see on the computer there. As I say, the magnets are big, they're superconducting magnets, they're filled with liquid helium, then they're surrounded by uh, this foil that's uh, an insulator, then surrounded by liquid nitrogen, so they're kept very cold. Um, and they are kept cold by filling them up every two weeks with liquid nitrogen or liquid helium every six months. They are like giant thermoses, just like a thermos keeps things very cold or very warm. Um, that's what the big can is in an NMR. The magnet is actually fairly small, um, but the can is needed to keep things so cool. Um, you typically have a hollow uh, electro, well, it's actually a permanent magnet um, with, um, that is charged. Um, so it's made up of, of wires that are wrapped around. And this, um, there's a probe um, which is used to hold the sample uh, and to drop the sample in from the top. The probe at the bottom has the electronics that manages uh, to send in the radio waves and, and receive the radio waves. That's what a probe looks like. And inside the probe is a couple little wires to produce a, what's called a saddle coil, which is used essentially, it's like a little antenna that sends out the radio waves and receives the radio waves from um, the sample. The sample is dropped in. It looks like a tiny pencil sized uh, tube. Uh, typically there's about 500 microliters. It's in an NMR tube and it's dropped into the giant magnet. And that's where it sits in the saddle coil that sends and receives the radio waves uh, into the sample, into the liquid sample. Uh, when it detects the ringing from the sample, it's converted to um, a spectrum. And this is what we see. Um, we see peaks, um, and some of them have very uh, symmetric shapes. You'll see doublets or triplets or quartets at different chemical shifts or different frequencies. Uh, we talk about chemical shifts in part per million, one ppm, there's a triplet there, and about seven and a half ppm, there's a doublet. Those splitting patterns are due to what's called spin coupling, and the intensities of the peaks are proportional almost exactly to the number of hydrogens. So unlike mass spec, NMR actually allows you to quantify things. The peak intensities tell you something about the quantity of the material. They tell you about the number of protons, and then they can be used to actually tell you about the concentration of the molecule as well. So just like mass to charge tells you about a molecule, chemical shifts in, in mass spec, chemical shifts in NMR tell you about a molecule. So the different hydrogen chemical shifts exhibit different frequencies, and that has to do with the shape and structure of the molecule. And the chemical shift patterns and the coupling patterns um, tell you a lot about how the molecule is structured. And someone who's trained in 
chemical synthesis or natural product analysis can often look at an NMR spectrum and in a few minutes figure out exactly what the molecule is. Different chemical groups on molecules, whether they're methylene, methine, um, aldehydic, uh, aromatic, amino, carboxylic protons will have different chemical shifts. And in protons, they can span from zero to 10 ppm. And so the positions of those shifts and the positions of those peaks can allow you to identify specific groups in a molecule. So this is an example of bromoethane. Um, so we can see an example where the methylene group, the CH2 group has, is, has a, a quartet. The methyl group, um, is made up of a triplet, and the triplet's at 2 ppm, whereas the quartet is around 3.8 ppm. And the fact that there's a quartet at the A group is at 3.5, 4 ppm is because the bromine, which is very electronegative, shifts um, the proton peaks um, further to the left or downfield. The methylene groups, which are far away from the bromine, are more upfield shifted. And then there's another signal called trimethylsilane, or TMS, which is used as a reference to identify where the signals are. And it's always at zero ppm. And the amount of TMS that's put into the sample allows us to actually measure the exact concentration of the bromomethane. Here's another one, ethylbenzene. And we can see, again, uh, aromatic peaks at around 7 ppm. That's where those hydrogen protons are. And then you can see the methylene and methyl groups. In this case, they're not shifted as far down because uh, the aromatic groups aren't as electronegative as bromine is. And at zero is TMS. NMR, when you collect them, if the mixture, um, they'll produce kind of initially ugly spectra where peaks are pointing up and peaks are pointing down. Um, so you have to phase them. Uh, sometimes you'll have to correct the symmetry of the peaks. So this is done by shimming. Uh, if you're collecting something with water, you'll have a giant peak in the middle of the spectrum, so you have to suppress that. And then you also have to adjust the position so that everything is referenced to zero ppm. So manually, there's usually a bit of, of fixing that's done with NMR spectrum. Um, as I mentioned, these are the techniques that, that help improve the spectrum, and these are usually done manually, but more recently we figured out a way to do these automatically. And so this makes NMR essentially the only technique in metabolomics that can be fully automated. So NMR produces a spectrum just like GCMS, LCMS, uh, BCPs, and, and TICs in mass spec. You see a whole pile of peaks, but instead of time on the axis, you see frequency or chemical shift on the axis. But that is still enough often to identify individual compounds uh, and usually it's multiple peaks are needed to identify the same compound. Um, but NMR, just like LC and GCMS, can be used to identify mixtures of compounds. Different techniques have different sensitivity. NMR is the least sensitive. LCMS is the most sensitive. GCMS sits in the middle. And so this is essentially showing the limited detection or lower detection limit. And then the number of compounds you can typically see or detect. So NMR, you can generally see between 50 and 100 compounds. GC, between 100 and 300 compounds. LCMS, it's not unusual to detect um, a few thousand features. Unfortunately, most of the things that you detect in LCMS, we can't identify. So in LCMS, we have lots of unknowns, whereas in NMR, almost everything we detect is, is knowable. Some of you mentioned that you do either targeted or untargeted mass spec or metabolomics. Um, in, in targeted metabolomics, uh, these are often either kit-based systems or use reference standards. Um, they allow you to precisely quantify. They usually use triple quad mass specs or linear iron traps mass specs. And you can quantitatively measure between 100 and maybe 500 compounds. Untargeted uses high resolution mass specs and you use different techniques. You use a lot of clustering and peak detection feature selection, and metabolite annotation. And those also can allow you to identify between 200 and 500 compounds, but they can also allow you to discover completely novel metabolites, which targeted metabolomics doesn't allow you to do. 
So untargeted metabolomics is great for hypothesis uh, testing, um, whereas targeted metabolomics is great for validating uh, or doing things like biomarker discovery or, or assessment. So if you compare the two, targeted metabolomics has limited coverage. Um, it's limited for the potential for discovery, um, but it allows you to quantify things, absolutely. It allows you to do automation, which makes it very fast. It also is very standardizable, and that also is a real strength. With untargeted metabolomics, um, you're detecting tens of thousands of features, so there's a lot of data you can generate. There's a great potential for hypothesis generation for discovering novel metabolites. Uh, but untargeted techniques don't allow you to do quantitation. And targeted is very slow relative to targeted. And it's still a process that needs considerable standardization. Uh, every, grab, every group, every lab around the world does untargeted metabolomics differently. And so uh, it makes it really hard uh, to exchange and share data and understand what people are doing. Um, so you might detect a bias in my presentations. I certainly prefer targeted metabolomics over untargeted, uh, but with improvements slowly, untargeted metabolomics is getting better and better. So with targeted metabolomics, you'll take your sample, um, you'll run it through GCMS, LCMS, or NMR through a standard workflow. You'll identify and quantify metabolites. Then you'll do data reduction, data analysis from the identified and quantified metabolites, and then you can go straight to your biological interpretation. With untargeted metabolomics, you often have to work with a large number of samples, um, and you use the large number of samples to uh, help compare and extract the most significant signals. So you don't do any identification initially with untargeted metabolomics. Instead, you do a lot of your data analysis and reduction and multivariate statistics to select the peaks. And from there, you reduce the number of peaks that you want to analyze. And from there, you do the metabolite identification. And that takes a long time. And it still means that even after a metabolite identification, you still haven't got to the next step, which is the um, interpretation. So that's partly why untargeted metabolomics is an intrinsically slower technique than targeted. Um, these are examples of some of the tools that we use in our center, the Metabolomics Innovation Center. We have NMR, DIMS, LCMS, GCMS, um, CEMS, a whole range. And just the types of metabolites that you typically detect between the different techniques. So NMR is better for water soluble. LCMS and DIMS or direct injection is better for hydrophobic. A uh, whole range of fluids and samples that you can use. NMR is quite flexible, whereas NMS is a little less. The sample volumes, NMR is not sensitive, so it needs more sample volume, where LCMS is, is quite sensitive and GCMS is sort of in the middle. There's different preparation run times depending on the instruments, um, amount of data analysis, very different limits of detection. So NMR, about five micromolar, where mass spec LCMS is on the order of nanomolar number of compounds uh, that you can detect with these different techniques and, and identify and quantify uh, is ranges. The LCMS methods are now up to around 500 uh, metabolites. Um, if you compare between the different techniques, uh, take the same sample, run it through NMR, run it through GCMS, run it through DIMS, they only overlap by about 10 to 20 percent. So these are very orthogonal methods for identifying compounds. And so this is why it's often a good idea to use multiple techniques, multiple platform to get a full picture of the metabolites. Choosing one platform kind of restricts you uh, to, to what you can do and analyze. So with the latest techniques in NMR, uh, it's possible to identify between 50 to 200 metabolites in a sample. With the better techniques for GCMS, you can get up to about 100 to 150 metabolites that you can quantify. Uh, you can identify, but not quantify, up to two or 300 uh, metabolites in GCMS. With things like direct injection mass spectrometry, you can identify and semi-quantify about 150 compounds. If you integrate DIMS and LCMS um, and with targeted techniques, uh, and even with untargeted techniques, you can identify 
uh, and semi-quantify or fully quantify about 300 to 500 compounds. With lipidomics, some of the best techniques uh, can get up to about 3,000 lipids identified and semi-quantified. And then with phytochemical analyses and the more exotic drug and pesticide residue analysis, often you have to use pure HPLC systems, although mass spec systems are also getting, getting better. Um, I'm looking at my time and I know I'm running a little over and people are probably getting hungry for, for lunch. Um, I might, I don't know, Rashad, um, Francis, do you think I should carry on or should we perhaps call it, uh, call it a, or give a break to everyone now? Who, who wants to break now? Can How you... much time do you have left, uh, David? I think it's about five or 10 minutes. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> I suggest you finish it then maybe, yeah, maybe a longer or 45 minute break after or something. Sure. Um, Okay, so this is um, sort of a, a bit of a detail about untargeted metabolomics. We're gonna be talking about it a few times over the course of the day. Um, in untargeted metabolomics, you run many samples and you separate and are looking at thousands of metabolites. Uh, a typical untargeted study will take hundreds of samples and you may run things over days or weeks. The problem with running days and weeks of runs is that LC instruments and MS instruments aren't reproducible. So they vary in terms of their separation. They vary in terms of the intensities. And, and from run to run, we, we see what are called batch variations. So these changes in retention time, intensity, mass measurements make it difficult to sort of merge or compare these features and to scale them. So, what you might get if you're running a bunch of samples on day one, a bunch of samples on day two, a bunch of samples on day three is that you'll get changes in intensity. Uh, you can see changes from day one to day two, day two, everything is reduced intensities. Uh, and you'll get changes in retention time. So if you merge everything from day one, day two and day three, you get that kind of messy look, which is those colored lines above. But if it's the same sample and essentially the same metabolites, you really should be only seeing um, five peaks and they should all be um, nicely aligned and nicely overlapped. And so this is what both um, batch correction and, and uh, sample uh, alignment, peak alignment is intended to do in, in untargeted mass spec. So this is an example um, with real material, real data. Um, and you can see the different colors correspond to the different LC retention times and the intensities from this um, uh, base peak chromatogram measurement. And so you can see the overlaps and the variations under the word raw. And then you can see things like cow, XCMS and block shift. These are techniques to do uh, spectral alignment or chromatographic alignment and batch correction. And you can see how things that were, you know, initially two or three very distinct clusters have now aligned into single peaks. So this is one of the critical things that's often done in untargeted mass spectrometry. And it's done also for untargeted NMR as well. In addition to the alignment, you also have to do scaling. And so there are cases where things, the instrument gets weaker and weaker, the signal gets weaker over time. Uh, sometimes, depending on the injection order, um, depending on how dirty things are, um, sometimes you'll get uh, high or low intensities. So with, with these things changing either with retention order or batch changes with intensity, you also need to do scaling so that you can uh, ensure that all of the peaks are of the same height. And this is why often quality control samples or quality control standards are added in untargeted metabolomics. This allows you to, to correct all of those peak intensity issues. This is not an issue with targeted metabolomics. So all the things I'm showing as I say are for untargeted metabolomics. And it's these corrections that take a fair bit of time. And if they're not done right, you can get some really improper results. So with liquid chromatography mass spec, you have an LC thing that generates um, a set of retention times for peaks. Um, and then with mass spec, um, you can also get masses. And so you can end up with uh, not just a, a two-dimensional 
um, chromatogram with height and, and, and or intensity and retention time, but you can end up with um, a three-dimensional picture uh, where you have mass to charge, retention time, and the intensity. Uh, so we're looking kind of like a, um, you know, black is very intense and yellow is, is not very intense and dark red is, is more intense. And you can see the, the plot in a more three-dimensional view in the corner where we're showing retention time, intensity, and mass to charge. And so um, this is what you typically collect in an untargeted um, MS study. Now, if, that's, if that was one sample, if you had a bunch of samples where you had a whole bunch of different retention times, a whole bunch of different intensities, instead of getting the simple thing that I showed, you get this, where there's all kinds of peaks. And it seems like maybe your samples are more, more information rich than they are, but they aren't because you have to do these retention time and mass shift corrections. So what you do and a lot of the techniques that you'll hear about later today and, and uh, tomorrow as well are performing these batch corrections, performing these retention time adjustments, performing the peak alignments to reduce the number of, of signals to allow you to identify um, the relevant ones and then to identify the significant ones and then to annotate those peaks. And that's the, the main goal of untargeted metabolomics. So you go from spectra, whether it's LCMS or NMR spectra, to lists of metabolites. And that's done with either untargeted or targeted metabolomics. And then as we go through the rest of the course, we'll try and go from these lists or annotated collections of metabolites and their concentrations or their relative concentrations to pathways. And going from those lists to pathways means you can interpret the data. And so we'll go through that as well, uh, both today and tomorrow uh, using tools like MetaboAnalyst and HMDB. And from those lists and pathways, we can also identify markers and biomarkers. Um, and these are used to help even generate models and perform systems biology studies. Um, and these are some of the things that we'll dabble in a little bit uh, towards the end of the course. So there's lots of challenges and we're trying to deal with these. We deal with going from spectra to lists. We worry about data integrity and quality, spectral alignment, spectral normalization. We worry about data reduction and classification, thinking about significance, which are the significant metabolites, which ones are the insignificant ones. And we worry about metabolite annotation, identification and quantification. We're gonna learn about that today. And then tomorrow and part of today, we'll learn about how to go from those lists to things like pathways and biomarkers, how to do pathway mapping, how to do pathway identification, how to do biological interpretation, and how to identify worthwhile markers for moving into practical applications.